Hello? Good morning. I, we're going to get ready to start. Uh, we know that there's some more people coming, and we're going to just um, let them join us when they can. My name is Pam Gregory, and I am the director of the Chairman's Accessibility and Innovation Initiative. And in the very back row, very back row, even though I told him to sit in the front and be prominent, <laughs> is Jamal Masrui. Uh, he's wearing a blue shirt and tie, and he is the deputy director of the Accessibility and Innovation Initiative. And here we have Dr. Alan Gregerman. And uh, I do have some flyers, and in the email that I sent out, it contained information about his background. But um, he's had two bestseller books. One is Lessons Learned from the Sandbox. And the second one, Surrounded by Geniuses, which is what really got me excited. And he is the CIO, that's the Chief Innovation Officer for, Venture, for VentureWorks. And VentureWorks does consultings, especially for startups. They do strategic planning, develop new ways of doing business, and actually try to apply and instill innovation as a value in terms of working with companies. Um, there's one thing that, that um, I just wanted to mention. I met Dr. Gregerman at my temple. So I always knew him as Alan. I didn't know that he was a big shot. But I would like walk and talk with him over bagels and coffee. And every single time I talked to him, I felt like I had just been on a two week vacation. He was just so refreshing and so smart. Um, so I, I'm hoping to feel like I've been on a two-week vacation. That's a high bar. It's <laughs> a high bar, I know. But, um, and then also, too, I mean, his book is, is really awesome. That's my own personal opinion. Um, and we've shared it. It's been shared around. And um, so anyway, you know, hopefully we'll have a dialogue going. So please feel free to ask questions. Thank you. Great, thanks. One more thing I wanted to mention is that we do have people using an assistive listening device. So we have this wireless mic, and if you want to ask something, just raise your hand or let yourself be known, and I'll bring the mic over to you. Thanks. Great. Is this on? Yes? Everyone can hear me? Super? Wherever you guys are? Okay. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you this morning and to talk with you about my favorite subject, uh, which is innovation, and to hopefully create kind of discussion or dialogue about kind of the potential for innovation and innovative thinking to solve the most kind of important and compelling kind of problems or opportunities or challenges that uh, your organization or your organizations, because I realize there are people from different organizations, or any company or organization might face. Um, I have a kind of different view of innovation than a lot of other folks in the innovation field. Um, the standard view of innovation is that there are a limited number of people in the world who are particularly innovative. That they are born and have like a gift for innovation, okay? So that's a, that's a, um, that's a common idea. Lots of books written about it, lots of studies, lots of panels about it. Uh, I tend to view that that's not only the wrong idea, but kind of a disabling idea, because it disables the rest of us those of us who don't raise our hands and think of us as particularly innovative, from being as innovative as possible. Um, and I have a lot of data, some of which is not widely accepted in the world around us, um, of why what I believe is correct. And what I believe is that everyone has the potential to be remarkably innovative. Um, the main data I use is some data that I worked on 10 years ago when I wrote my first book, uh, Lessons from the Sandbox. 
and that was data based on studying 400 children from the ages of zero to six. Uh, and I studied them to figure out why they constantly came up with new ideas as opposed to adults who consistently have trouble coming up with new ideas. And which was clear, what was clear to me is as kids, we are born with the ability to be innovative. Um, and we're born with the ability to be innovative because as kids, we don't know enough uh, to be locked into a certain way of thinking. Um, as kids, we engage the world head on and believe that anything is possible. Uh, and we believe that anything can go together. Um, as adults, we believe certain things kind of go together. Uh, we believe that certain food goes with ketchup. And we believe that certain books are books that we read at certain times. And we believe all kinds of things. But as kids, anything is possible. Um, a good way to prove it was I did an experiment with a bunch of kindergartners uh, and then a bunch of adults. So I gave adults, this is, I'll use this because I didn't, forgot to bring. So I gave adults a, a basketball. And I asked adults to figure out what they would do with a basketball. And oddly enough, invariably, adults used a basketball to play basketball. That was a real stretch for them. Uh, <laughs> But they used, they summoned up their ability. Now why? Because some of them had played basketball as they were growing up. Others liked basketball. They were fans of basketball. Um, but most people had a notion that this was a basketball. And so what the heck, let's use it as a basketball. That's a really bold move. Um, then I gave all these kindergartners a basketball. Now some of them knew about basketball. Some of them liked basketball, played it at home. And I said, so what would you do with a basketball? And certainly they used it as basketball but they used it as a kickball, and they used it to play Foursquare, and they used it when they got tired as something to sit on, um, and they used it as something they could balance on their head, and sadly, some of them, I have to admit, mostly boys, decided they could use it as a weapon by throwing it at other kids. Um, and then some of them, uh, mostly girls, decided this was a really cool thing and put it under their shirts and decided they were pregnant, you know, just because that sounded like a cool thing to do with it. And literally, they came up with like 50 different things you could use a ball for, all because it's possible. You know, because they weren't so set in the idea that a ball can simply be used to be a ball. Um, so I know, and I could spend hours talking with you about some of the other things I've learned about kids, but since I have a room of adults, I won't do that. But I simply know, as kids, we all were wired to be innovative, but somewhere between childhood and the world of work, we lost, most of us lost the knack for being innovative, except for these few kind of crazy people that we label as amazingly innovative people. Um, I'd argue in part we lost it because in whatever culture we were in, at somewhere between the age of five and seven, a bus shows up to take us away, uh, to take us away from a world where anything is possible, and to take us where, to a world where actually a limited number of things are possible. Now, under the guise of um, maintaining our creativity, we're taken away to school. You know, and, but at school, what we're really taught to do is be fine, upstanding members of society. And we're also, at school, taught to start to gravitate toward a subject. And then, as we get farther and farther along, or further and further along in the course of studies, um, we're asked to be more and more specific about what we study. So some of us decide to study communications, and some of us decide to be engineers, and some of us decide to be lawyers. And some of us, like me, who couldn't decide what to do, become geographers, because geography seemed to be I could study anything I wanted to. So I actually have a bachelor's and a master's and a doctorate in geography. Pretty important stuff, don't you think? It was always exciting when I would get taken or invited to friends' houses um, during college and grad school, and they would tell their parents that I was trained as a geographer, and invariably their parents would say, wow, that's awesome, I bet you know all the state capitals. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd say, yeah, you know, that's what I've been spending the last six years of education doing, just trying to master the state capitals, and I'm so grateful there only are 50 of them, you know? Because otherwise this would have been a really taxing thing for me to study here. Um, but, um, but what I found in studying geography was geography was really about kind of the world and the differences that occur in places and why different things happen in kind of different places. So that was a really cool thing to study and it didn't seem to have many bounds. But most disciplines have kind of bounds and so, and they also teach us a way to think. 
And once we've learned to think the way they've taught us to think, then that's the way we approach all the different problems that we have. Um, and so that's a huge challenge because we now know that the best ideas are developed by people who cut across disciplines and are able to work together across disciplines to come up with a better idea. So let me give you an example. And I think this example is actually relevant in a different aspect of life to some of the folks that you work with. So um, for the last 40 years, car companies in their infinite wisdom have had projects going on around the world to try and create cars that will not crash into each other. That's kind of cool, isn't it? I mean, and in fact, if I could create a car that wouldn't crash into each other, um, aside from saving an awful lot of money on repair bills, I would dramatically broaden the number of people who actually could have transportation, okay? Um, because if the car would help me to kind of get where I was going um, without running into other cars or anything else, um, then uh, that would allow some of my other skills to come out, and it, but it would enable me to drive. A broader group of people would be able to drive. And so for 40 years, Folks who have been working in car companies, basically automotive engineers, have been trying to solve this problem. And lo and behold, because you have yet to see, I'm assuming, um, in the Washington area anywhere else, a car that doesn't collide with another car, um, they failed miserably. Okay, absolutely failed. Couldn't figure it out. Automotive engineers, bless their hearts. People trained for their entire careers to work with cars and car design. Could not figure out how to create a car that wouldn't crash. Um, now, one might argue if they could, but you were the only one that had one of these cars, then that wouldn't be so clever. But be as it may, for 40 years, the people who ought to know by our kind of narrow view of the power of expertise and discipline, the people who ought to know how to do that could not figure that out. Lo and behold, a couple of years ago, an automotive engineer, relatively young, so that's a kind of at times an asset because sometimes when we're younger, we're a little bit more open-minded automotive engineer at the Nissan Research Laboratory in southern Japan suddenly started thinking that maybe there were other aspects of life or other things in the world that would provide better insight than automotive engineers could to this problem. And so he imagined that there might be a place in the world in which moving bodies go really, really fast in highly congested areas and never crash into each other. Okay? Is that possible? Anybody think that's possible? And what he noticed, and I guess it was easier for him because Japan is an island, is that in fact, Japan was surrounded by non-crashing moving things. <laughs> Fish. They hang out in schools or classes or whatever they do. They swim relative to their size really fast and they absolutely never crash into each other. So that's kind of cool, I guess. Um, and they never needed an automotive engineer to explain to them how to make that happen. They could figure it out on their own. So he decided in a non-traditional innovative way that he would find somebody who knew a lot about fish. That he'd talk to enough people who knew a lot about cars, but he'd find somebody who knew a lot about fish. And so he founded a local university, an expert in marine biology, and asked him to explain why it is that fish never crash into each other. And for the marine biologist, welcome. We're having a good time. Please feel free to come in. <laughs> the, um, and um, so he asked him to explain. And he said, well, you know, it's actually pretty simple. Fish have figured it all out. Fish communicate with each other constantly. And they communicate by sending signals. And the, re the way they keep distance from themselves and the way they all go in the same path is they send three different types of signals to each other that allows them to always stay kind of in formation or move off formation and get back into formation without running into each other. And because there had been no recorded cases of major kind of fish accidents or pileups in the sea, <laughs> Um, he got even more excited about the possibility of this idea. He brought this person back, and they figured out how to incorporate these three communication ideas into the structure of a car. There are now today, in a test track in southern Japan, eight cars programmed to think like fish that have for several months been driving around nonstop, 
and have not crashed into each other. That's kind of cool. Leads one to believe that there is likely to be a breakthrough at some point, we have to figure out if it's affordable, in the world of non-colliding cars. All because somebody who knew a lot about cars decided to ask somebody who knew a lot about something else which was particularly relevant, and they combined their knowledge to be brilliant. I think that's kind of cool. Well, I think that's kind of how innovation works. So when I said at the outset uh, that my kind of alternative view is we all have the potential to be innovative, it's because we all have the potential to be curious and we all have the potential to be open-minded. And if we are willing to look beyond the world that we find ourselves in for ideas and insight and best practices that can occur anywhere, and be willing to combine those with the things we know best, we have the ability to make remarkable things happen. But it won't happen by people with one particular technical expertise just hanging out and just trying to solve a problem based on a limited set of knowledge. So what I'd like to do is share with you a little bit more about your potential to be brilliant as individuals and collectively. Um, I'd like to share with you a bit of how genius and kind of brilliance actually happens. And then I'd like to give you some ideas about how simply you could be open-minded and you and your partners who you work with to solve the problems and opportunities that matter most to you might kind of collaborate in new and compelling ways and in the process kind of unlock a world full of ideas. Um, let me ask you. Um, how many of you arrived at work today, um, went to a meeting or two, uh, maybe did some email or talked on the phone or did whatever, maybe ran into colleagues at the coffee pot, um, and then suddenly sat down at your desk overwhelmed by the feeling that you were surrounded by geniuses? I could wait if I waited would someone raise their hand? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, yeah, I appreciate that. Okay. Um, so that's the first idea I'd like you to think about because I need you to think about the fact that everyone uh, that you work with in some way is a genius. Now, um, how might I get you to understand this? Well, you know, here's one of the dynamics I wrestle with because I work inside lots of corporations and organizations. Um, and one of the things that I find in organizations is that we don't have as good an understanding of all of the kind of talents and potentials and capabilities of all the folks we work with. And I believe part of the reason we don't do this is because we are burdened by the job titles or the things that are on people's doors. So we tend instantly when we arrive to think of this person as that kind of person. Oh, you know, they're in contracts. Ah! I'm sorry, my hearing got that. Or, you know, they're in finance. Ah! Or they're in human resources. God! God, those people make it difficult for me. You know, or whatever function they're in. And so we tend to think about people that way. And I find that's the biggest issue in corporations because in corporations, we need people to work across corporations. But we have such stereotypes about the different types of people. And granted, a lot of people live up to their stereotypes, you know? They've been trained in a certain way. They behave in a certain way. They're not as flexible as they could be. So I've been doing this thing in, in companies and organizations, which I find to be really cool. And so I'll share it with you. You could try it out here and then tell me what you think. And it's really, really very simple. I simply say to people, we're going to create a culture of, find, of unlocking genius in our organization, and you're all going to do it. And here's what you're going to do. Every day until we've exhausted all of the folks here, you're going to identify someone in this organization you either don't know very well or you have a visceral reaction to when you hear their name or you hear their job title, okay? So all of you already are thinking about the people who you have a visceral, re I can sense it. You know? and, here, and you're gonna find that person and you're gonna ask them for 15 minutes of their time. And then you're gonna sit down with them, you know, you could do it if coffee would help, you could sit with, over a cup of coffee. You're gonna sit down with them and 
you're going to do the following. You're going to have a conversation with them, and your objective is to find 10 things you have in common with them that have nothing to do with work. OK? That's all I want people to do is find 10 things. So some of you are grimacing. How is that possible that you're grimacing? OK. Um, and then um, you're going to do that the next day with somebody else. And you're going to do that every day until you've had conversations with as many people as you can in the organization. And what you'll discover actually about two minutes into the first person you talk with is that this is very, very, very easy to do. OK? How many people thought when I first mentioned that, God, that's a hard thing to do? Anybody have that reaction? That's a hard thing to do. OK. Well, I guarantee you it's an easy thing to do. Um, in fact, I would guarantee, because I've now done this in a bunch of different countries, that assuming we could work out any of the kind of language issues or communication issues, that you could literally, within, uh, you know, I say 15 minutes, within five minutes, find 10 things you have in common with every other human being on the planet. I'm certain of that. Absolutely certain of that. Now, why would you do that, and how does that benefit innovation? Well, I would do it because it turns out if I can discover things I have in common with other people, then it's hard to dislike them, you know? Because now they're kind of like me. And so it's very, very hard to dislike people who now I have 10 things in common with. I actually start to think, you know, you're not the worst person on the planet here. I'm kind of shocked you're in human resources. But, you know, you're not the, <laughs> you're not the worst person on the planet here. Um, and so now I have a basis for following up and getting back in touch with that person. Now I'm asked to be part of a meeting where we're going to come up with new ideas. And for some strange reason, there's something about all these people who show up that I actually like. And the other thing that's interesting is I've uncovered some things that matter to them that they might be pretty clever about. Or if they're not totally clever about it now, the fact that now I know these things that they're interested in, that they've expressed to me, make it so that they would be more willing to do some hard work to get smarter about things related to those areas. So I kind of change the whole equation simply by being willing to have conversations with people. Well, it turns out having conversations with other people is fundamental to innovation because as the example of the cars that don't collide points out, rarely does somebody know the answer to any particular problem just by themselves. But a few people talking to each other and broadening the mix of what we know enables us to start to cast a wider net and be far more innovative than we could ever be on our own. And innovation is about people being open to the possibility of being smart and learning together. So when I say how many of you are surrounded by geniuses at work, I believe you actually are, you just don't realize it, or you haven't taken the time to get to know what your colleagues and coworkers are smart about. But we'll spend some more time thinking about that in a little while. OK, the second question I have for you is, how many of you leave work, um, head home in whatever mode of transport you use, um, hear or see all kinds of exciting messages, um, advertisements, loud noise, traffic, craziness, metro not working as perfectly as possible, people being hostile because the metro is not working particularly well, um, aggressive drivers um, in some jurisdictions probably having a gun in their car. No, but anyway. Uh, and you can find the list of which jurisdictions those are on the internet. It's very easy. OK, but anyway. Um, uh, more hassles than you'd like to have on the way home. Uh, and then suddenly you arrive home, sit down, and say to yourself, not only do I work with geniuses, I live in a world in which I'm literally surrounded by geniuses. How many of you believe that? That's a real stretch, isn't it? Well, I would argue each day we pass by 100 people who could change our lives. 100 people who know something we don't know, and what they know combined with what we know could make us smarter more, more thoughtful, more capable of solving issues, but we never take the time to meet these people. 
We absolutely don't. We walk by them because we have more important things to do. When if we had some systematic way to engage people, we'd have a far better opportunity to come up with breakthroughs, combine knowledge, share insight, and be brilliant. So our challenge is to figure out how we do that. Now, some of them, it's pretty easy to figure out their brilliance. Others, we'd probably have to scratch below the surface. But let me give you some sense of how you do that. OK. How many of you are really good singers? Oh, come on. OK, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for being here. OK. And how many of you are really good dancers? OK. So um, let me ask you the question slightly differently now, because I didn't get as big a response as I was hoping for. Uh, but I got a typical response, actually. I normally get 1% to 2% of, of folks in your predicament, adults, uh, <laughs> to say they're good singers. And so let me ask you in a slightly different way. And so here's the question. I'd like you to think back to the time when all of you were just arriving at kindergarten, OK? And I have the opportunity every year, because I started 11 years ago, a nonprofit uh, organization in the lowest income schools in Montgomery County where we try and inspire kids. And so every year I get to see a new group of kids. And so I get to ask them this. So now I'd like you to think you're all kindergartners. You've just arrived at school. So now let me ask you, class, out of curiosity, how many of you are really good singers? Okay. And how many of you are really good dancers? OK. So when I asked you guys in your current state in life how many were good singers, I got one person, thankfully, to raise their hand. Um, when I ask kindergartners how many are really good singers, the response I get is, oh, Mr. Gregerman, I know every song ever recorded. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and they probably do because they probably bought this fabulous three CD set, you know, you can get on an infomercial, every song ever recorded. Uh, though they now have iPods, so they can have 2,000 songs, OK? Um, when I ask them how many are really good dancers, half of them go, oh, Mr. Gregman, I know all the latest moves. And the other half just get up and start dancing. <laughs> OK? So again, here's my issue with all of you. You know what? I don't even know most of you, but I have issues with you anyway. No. <laughs> but if I had a 10-minute conversation with you, I'd love you all. But anyway, no, so my issue is this. Um, somewhere between kindergarten and the world of adult life, almost all of you lost the ability to sing. That's absolutely awesome, don't you think? That's remarkable that we could have created a society in which we literally sucked the song out of every one of you, OK? Um, but we've done that, so that's really cool. Now, my guess is you probably sing to yourselves, right? But I've, I've set such a high bar. How many of you are good at singing in your very modest group of people here? And so you're unwilling to admit that you're good at singing. Now, interestingly, singing is one of only a few things that have existed in every culture that's ever been on the planet. Okay? Every culture is sung. And that's because of a few important things to know about singing. The first is the human body was designed to sing. So that's kind of a cool thing to know. And the second is that singing is fun to do. How many of you, when you're left to your own devices, sing and enjoy it? Any of you? All of you, OK? So singing is, feels good, doesn't it? OK. So the reason I like to think about singing is because there is a song in every one of you and in everyone that you will ever know. And our challenge is to figure out what that song is and bring that song out as a key to us being more innovative. And the folks who believe that only a few people are innovative are the folks who are unwilling to take the time to find the song in everyone. So my job, I like to think, is to help companies and organizations figure out how to find the song in all their people, and to take those songs and create a symphony of kind of new ideas about what's possible. So it's 1948. And a guy, just like any one of us, but his name was George de Mestral, is walking through the Alps with his dog. I was able to get his actual dog and bring it to you today. Actually, for those of you who are old enough to realize this is the dog that was in The Exorcist, able to turn its head entirely around. Okay, but seriously. Okay, 
So he's walking through the Alps with his dog and he notices that his dog is covered with burrs, okay? Anybody ever walked anywhere and gotten like burrs covering you? So, so this is something that's happened to people for literally thousands of years, okay? Burrs have existed for a long time. And all but this guy, George de Mistral, assumed that burrs were just a nuisance, just some natural thing put there to torment us. But he thought burrs were cool. He thought burrs were so cool that he decided to take some off his dog, bring them back to his little apartment or chalet or whatever he lived in, and look at them under a microscope. And when he looked at them under a microscope, he thought they were even cooler than he'd ever imagined. How could something bump into you and then attach to you? What a brilliant idea. He was so excited about it, he started to draw pictures of how he would use burrs to improve the lives of human beings. Okay? So none of you probably walked through the woods and said, I can use burrs to improve the lives of human beings. None of you probably. So you missed out on a big business opportunity here. <laughs> he got so excited that he patented burrs or his recreation of burrs and started to communicate with all kinds of companies about how they could use burrs. He was so excited about it and his passion was contagious. And so today his excitement, 60 years later, has led to burrs being found in over 100,000 products worldwide. By being curious about burrs, he had discovered Velcro. Velcro wasn't discovered by a bunch of scientists in a lab who were responding to a federal government challenge. Not that, not that it couldn't happen that way. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm open to that possibility. So I'm open to that possibility. But it was discovered by a guy walking with his dog and being curious about it. That should make you feel pretty darn good because it means that you have the ability to be open and curious about all kinds of things. And they don't even have to be like a scientific technical thing where you have to be an engineer. Anybody know what the largest car rental company in the world is? Enterprise, someone said? Okay, Zipcar, that's a cool idea. I think at some point it will be one of the largest car companies in the world. I love their idea, it's kind of brilliant. Avis is a good idea. Yellow cab. Yellow cab. Okay. No, I like that idea as well. Hertz, anyone? Yeah. Okay. So Hertz invent <coughs> Hertz invented the rent car business in 1927, um, and they figured out how to do it really well. They realized people would be arriving in cities, either at airports or train stations. If I had cars there for them, they might decide to rent a car. Kind of a brilliant business idea. And they kept investing in technology and a number of other aspects of their business, customer service, so that until the year 2001, they were the largest car rental company in the world. Now, in 1954, Avis was started at Willow Run Airport outside Detroit with a similar notion to Hertz, but with a cool slogan. We're Avis, we're number two, and we try harder. There were buttons that said we try harder. That was really good because it got people to believe, well, Maybe I should give Avis a try because they try harder than Hertz. Now Avis, other than having different colors, wasn't appreciably different than Hertz. They had a few technology ideas, but generally they were kind of the same. So their big lever was we try harder. That was really a nice thing. And they were able to use the idea we try harder until 1999 when they kept trying to say we try harder, but they didn't say we're number two, we try harder because by 1999 they were number five. So it just shows you what trying harder gets for you, okay? <laughs> kind of declined, okay. But be that as it may. Okay, so they tried harder, it didn't exactly work for them. And, but in the 1970s, a guy in, uh, oh, Wichita, Tulsa, somewhere, I'm not so good on the plain states. Gee, I'm a geographer, I should know better, shouldn't I? <laughs> I didn't specialize in the plain states, okay? But, um, if you're from there, I apologize. Okay, so he decided there was another way. There were a bunch of other people who needed to rent a car. Those were folks whose cars were in the shop or weren't working. And so he would provide a company that would actually do that for them. So he opened up a few branches and then he started selling franchises. And business, sadly, was not going that well. Pretty cool idea, but not going that well. And it was not going well for one particular reason. And that was the people he was trying to get to rent a car were at the moment short of transportation. They had no way to get his rent-a-car. Now, he needed to be a genius, actually, and one of his colleagues actually came up with a brilliant idea. And that brilliant idea was to go around and ask people why they were not 
borrowing from Enterprise, renting a car from Enterprise, and what was the big issue that Enterprise had to address? And one of the folks, he just asked one of these cust potential customers, and they said, well, you know, I just can't get to Enterprise. It's not particularly convenient. But if you picked me up, that would be really cool. And so he said, well, that is a cool idea. I'm a genius because I asked somebody a question, they gave me an answer, and I'll try it. And he took out an ad in the Orlando paper where his franchise was, and it says, rent a car from Enterprise because at Enterprise will pick you up. And for the first year, he just kept driving to pick up these people until he could rent enough cars to hire staff to have somebody else pick them up. Um, that turned out to be such a brilliant idea that today, Enterprise Rent-A-Car, which came from nowhere, is the largest car rental company in the world. And they not only do that type of rental car, but they rent cars at airports and other places. All based on a brilliant idea that was pretty darn obvious to one guy but he suddenly figured out how to make a business of it. Sometimes asking the right questions and then doing simple things is all we need to do to be a major innovator. So to think that that could be a compelling innovation that would lead to the world's largest company in an industry, all by thinking just a little bit differently about what's possible. You guys and all the folks you work with and all the partners that you work with have the ability to think like this. You're not pre-programmed to be non-innovative. You're programmed, but we've kind of lost the knack for being open and curious about the things that matter most. And so part of the challenge is wandering around and figuring out how we can make a compelling difference by thinking differently. Sometimes brilliant ideas are right under our noses. And sometimes, I hate to say this, being in, um, with folks who have some connection to the federal government, Sometimes we're unwilling because we kind of believe we know it all or we should know it all to kind of be open to ideas that should be obvious. I gave a talk a couple of years ago um, to a group of CIOs, not chief innovation officers, but chief information officers for federal government agencies. And at the talk was the CIO for the Census Bureau. Um, and the Census Bureau, so I sat down at a lunch table after the talk and he was one of the people at my table and he said do you know anything about the census bureau and i said well you know i like the census i think it's a really good idea i said i know it started in 1790 and i said but there's one thing that concerns me about the census and that is that the census while i realize some traditions are really good traditions the census has an odd tradition in modern times and that is that the 2010 census is going to be done with a pencil and a piece of paper just like it was done in the year 1790. And I said, that's kind of an interesting thing to be doing, given that we actually have newer technology than that. So I said, you know, wouldn't the Census Bureau want to use like computers and stuff like that to do the census? Wouldn't that be more efficient? And he says, well, you know that we tried that. And I said, yeah, I, I'm being kind of facetious, because I know that you just spent $640 million to create a handheld computer um, that would be used by census takers. They would go door to door and collect data on this handheld computer. And so I said, so I know that you just wasted $640 million of the taxpayer's money. And as a taxpayer, I feel really sad because this problem had been solved by somebody else, but you were determined to waste our money to try and solve it again. Because they'd spent money to have a contractor, bless their hearts, they shall go and name, but they were named Harris Corporation. Well, I always want to give credit to people who've done brilliant things and have screwed up in a way that's insightful. So anyway, so, so the Harris Corporation got a $640 million contract. They probably got a smaller contract, but it kept ballooning up. This was in a day when things could balloon up um, to develop this handheld computer. And they couldn't figure out how to make it work. So it just was scrapped, and the census takers came with their pad of paper to take notes. Okay, so that was kind of cool, I guess. George Washington would have been pleased because he had something to do with the handheld pencil and paper kind of census. Um, so I said, you know, so what's really sad to me is it didn't have to be that way because somebody had already solved your problem. So he said, what do you mean? And I said, well, you know, and if you guys had been observant every day, in fact, not only had someone solved your problem, and it wasn't as though they were in some vast corner of the world that you'd never find, but they showed up at your office every single day for the entire time that you were thinking about creating a handheld computer, 
and for the entire time that you were wasting all of our money. They showed up every day and you just never asked them about it. And he said, what do you mean? I said, well, you know, have you ever seen these guys wearing really stylish brown clothing, <laughs> driving really stylish brown trucks? And he said, you mean the UPS guy? And I said, yes. Did you ever notice that they have a handheld computer? Did you ever also imagine that their handheld computer knows every address in America? Did you ever notice that they don't compete directly with the federal government? And that one might even imagine, just to get some special suck up points, that they might be willing to share their technology with you? Why didn't you do it? To which he said something kind of that can't be repeated here. <laughs> no. Sometimes their ideas are already out there. And all we have to do is be open to the possibility that we can tap into somebody else's brilliance. 99% of all innovations are based on an idea that somebody's already had. 1% of all innovations are a totally breakthrough unique idea. Okay, And this goes back throughout time. So. Um, I just happened to be in uh, Venice, Italy, and there was an exhibit for a really, really clever guy named Leonardo da Vinci. This guy was really clever. You know, I got to hand it to him. This guy probably was more clever than most of us. I got I to gotta be honest with you. Um, we have the potential to be that clever, but he was a particularly clever guy. Um, and so he came up with some ideas 500 years ago um, that became inventions not that long ago. One of his most clever ideas was a detailed design for a helicopter. Okay, 550 years ago, he came up with a detailed design for a helicopter. So I said, all ideas, almost, are based on other ideas. Um, do you think he came up with that just on his own? Do you think he was just sitting around, you know, uh, talking to other famous Renaissance celebrities, and suddenly said, you know, I think what the world needs is a helicopter. You know, I could land in Venice here. You know, I could leave Venice. I could go to Rome. You know, I could have a good time. I think the world needs a helicopter. Unlikely. But you know what he did notice one day? A hummingbird. You know? And he said, hummingbird, that's kind of a cool thing. What if humans could do that? What if humans could kind of zoom into a place and then go up and then zoom into another place? That would be cool. I can envision a day when that happens. 99% of all ideas are based on observing, putting together things that haven't been put together before, and coming up with a breakthrough idea. And we have the ability to make that happen. Our challenge is, will we do that? Now, it's interesting. I have kind of an odd view of things because, as I mentioned, I'm a geographer. I have no specific base of knowledge, OK? So unlike engineers or scientists who know something or a lot about something, I just know a little bit about a lot of stuff. I don't know anything particular. So whenever I'm given a problem and whenever I'm working in organizations and given a problem, as opposed to suddenly saying, God, you know, I am so darn smart. Let me tell you my ideas. I say, well, you know, I bet somewhere in the world are solutions to this problem. That makes my job a lot easier because I bet the seven billion people on Earth, when kind of pulled together, probably know a lot more than any in one of us here. They might even know more than any particular organization. Our trouble is that one of the things that burdens us is not only our expertise, but our belief that some attribute of us or where we are makes it so that we ought to limit the search for ideas. Okay. So I'm excited as an example. I'm excited about the challenges that you guys are doing. Um, and um, if you were the only people who cared about these issues in the entire world, then uh, I guess you ought to feel you ought to just go out there and just ask for brilliant ideas. And whatever you get from Americans, because of course, as Americans, we're much smarter than anybody else in the world. Um, you could get like the best ideas. But you know, in a slightly different way than the world of UPS, as a geographer, I'd say, well, if these are the things I'm trying to solve, is anybody else out there in the world thinking about it? Or are there any other aspects of the world in which they've already thought about these ideas? And because I have a close personal connection being married to a Swede, to Sweden, and because I know that in Sweden, they 
you know, really spend a lot of time thinking about enabling every one of their citizens to reach their full potential. Um, my initial knee-jerk reaction was, God, maybe they know something too. And in fact, they do. Uh, in fact, they've been doing, so the challenge idea is a brilliant idea. Um, they've had for the last two years two challenges in Sweden to try and figure out how to use telecommunications and communications technologies and broadband to enable uh, people with disabilities to live their lives fully. And uh, they've made a lot of progress. And they, God help them, for a tiny country of only nine million people that happen to be socialists, or I was told that in like a debate recently. Oh, they're socialists, no. But anyway, um, they've put a fair amount of money to trying to solve this. So last year they had a competition uh, for corporations in Sweden to come up with ideas for technologies um, that would enable people with disabilities in the workplace and in education uh, to be more successful. And they made 10 awards to companies. Uh, on average, those awards are $300,000 each to develop technologies. Okay, so they've done that. And this year, they've just announced, and they're waiting to get their responses back, uh, 10 awards that they're going to make, again, for roughly $300,000 each to companies that can use telecommunications and communications technology to enhance the lives and leisure activities of people with disabilities. So, there, uh, so my gut reaction first is, you guys are doing great things, you're looking for great ideas, but let's see who else is looking for great ideas. Let's put our ideas together. Because if somebody figures out something in Sweden, or Finland, or Japan, or somewhere else that can make a difference in the lives of folks here, why wouldn't we use it? Uh, why wouldn't we tell them, here's a huge market opportunity here, and an awful lot of folks who could benefit from the value of what you do. So the first thing I always think about is who else could I, kind of before I have to be brilliant, who else has been brilliant that would really help me out and get me to think differently? So I always kind of challenge myself to do that. Now, then in terms of challenges, I always want to think about that there are a few basic motivations. I like to think there are two people, two kinds of people in the world. I mean, there's probably a lot more. There are folks who are simply motivated by money, and then there are folks who are motivated by other stuff. And research suggests that the folks who are motivated by other stuff, strangely enough, is a much bigger number than the folks who are motivated by money. And even people who are in for-profit businesses um, tend often to be motivated more by other stuff with the notion that maybe if I come up with something, I can be financially successful. So what's the other stuff? Well, um, what we do know from research is that the other stuff falls into kind of three buckets. Um, the first is that people are motivated and often innovate because they see the need to do something that has a compelling purpose to them. They believe in making a difference. Now, your purpose and my purpose might be different, but if we can find a purpose that matters to people, we can spark them to say, I'm willing to try some new things. The second is people are, are motivated because they have a burning desire to be able to develop a higher level of mastery in something that matters to them. So our ability to help them or be a partner in helping them to become smarter and at the top of their game in an area that really matters to them is compelling. And the third thing we know is that people tend to want to take on challenges if combined with purpose and the potential for mastery, they have the opportunity for some autonomy. They have the opportunity to kind of lead and take initiative and be the one who, once I know the challenge, can try and design a path to making it happen. That, for most folks, is more important than money. So how do we focus and get people kind of engaged in that way in thinking about the power and potential of challenges? Um, there's a wonderful example, and I'm assuming that it's something that you guys are thinking about doing. So, so there are other countries where there are ideas. There are folks in different stages of their lives or places where things might matter. Um, so I know you partner with universities, engineering schools, folks like that. You ought to do a heck of a lot more of that, I believe, because I believe those are folks who have fresh ideas. And so I brought my favorite salad spinner um, to explain to you an idea that's just based on a competition. So this is an OXO salad spinner. I love this brand. Most of their stuff works really well. 
Um, but that's insignificant to this. A biomedical engineering professor at Rice University challenged his class to figure out how to create a biomedical innovation that would significantly enhance the quality of life for people in the world's poorest countries and would require no energy other than human energy and cost less than $30 to make. Two young women in his class took up the challenge, did some homework on issues that mattered to them, one of which was blood-borne diseases um, in developing countries. And as they did their homework, they realized that one of the challenges is that all too late, if ever, do people in especially remote villages ever get tested for diseases which could be diagnosed in their blood and treated. Part of the problem was that in order to test, we have to, we have to be able to perform some procedures on their blood, one of which was to, in essence, be able to spin their blood so that we can separate it. They decided, as they would, as kind of naive folks who spent more time at, um, at Bed Bath & Beyond than they did <laughs> in technical laboratories, that there might be something in this store that they could use to solve this problem. And in fact, there was a salad spinner, something that could be used to spin and separate blood, much more cheaply than any of the major medical device manufacturers create this. So they bought themselves a few salad spinners. <coughs> Whoa. And then they retrofitted it to take 15 blood samples. And then they just started to spin their blood instead of salad. And what they found was that they could make it so it actually could separate blood in a way that that blood then could be tested clearly and someone could see with some other tests that existed on the market what blood-borne diseases folks in these villages had. All because they were challenged to make a difference by a professor who told them that their abilities shouldn't simply be used to make a lot of money, but to make the world a better place. And so they did that. So challenges and amazing ideas are going to happen all around us if we can find the right folks and motivate them in the right way to make a compelling difference. And so Sally Centrifuge, as they now call it, is being piloted in South America, Africa, and Asia. And its uh, initial tests are awesome. It's going to cost about $22 once they kind of build them in volume to make these. And they will be, in a simple but compelling way, changing the nature of healthcare for people in the poor world's poorest countries. So that's one example of folks that we ought to challenge uh, to think differently. Um, since I'm on the topic of medicine, I'll bring this little doctor over here. Um, <coughs> bless you. Uh, stethoscope. Everyone has probably seen and had used a stethoscope or had a stethoscope used on them. Stethoscope is an amazing invention because it allows you to listen to a human heart and lungs. Uh, I didn't bring a good one. I brought my toy one, but it still actually works. Um, anybody have any idea how old the stethoscope is? OK, 100 years old is a good guess. 200 years old is a good guess. In fact, 200 years old would be the exact answer to it. Because it was invented in the year 1811 by a French physician. And because this was a brilliant idea, it remained in exactly the same form for 198 years. Kind of looked like this. The materials were better. You could hear slightly better. Doctor kind of put it in his ears or health professional, listened into a heart, and heard the same stuff. Absolutely the same for 198 years. Why would one ever want to change this? Well, as I mentioned in the case of our friends at the Census Bureau, um, there are some things that have happened in the world in the last 200 years that might enhance even the most simple and basic diagnostic equipment. And if I had a vision and a challenge about a world that needed a tool that was affordable and could be better, um, then I might create some energy and excitement. And so the folks at 3M, 
along with their partners at a medical company called the Littman Company, decided they would take up that challenge. And they decided they would take up that challenge by simply combining a 198-year-old device with a relatively new device, which is a miniature computer. And so not much, I should have brought my iPad, uh, iPod Nano, but I forgot to bring it. But imagine an iPod Nano, something about an inch square, but a small digital computer. Imagine it attached to a stethoscope. Imagine that as I'm listening to a child's heart in the mountains of Bolivia or in rural northern India, I suddenly hear a heart irregularity. I could, as a health practitioner, I might be a rural nurse, I could write down my notes on what it sounded like, but what if I was able, in fact, to send a mini EKG or a mini echocardiogram to a medical center in Delhi or in La Paz where a doctor could look at it and make a diagnosis. That would be pretty amazing. Well, with the new stethoscope for $1,300, I now place this to a heart, I push a button, and it gets sent to anyone in the world I want to send it to instantly. And it was all because folks decided there was a challenge, and that was the health especially of children, but the health of folks in remote poor areas, and that there was technology now that would enable us to think differently. And so folks put things together that didn't belong before, but obviously belong today. Those are the most skillful kind of and thoughtful scientists in the world. And so they're another group of people that we ought to be hanging out with. We ought to be inspiring them regularly. There is, um, one of the ways that I get information is I just read everything that I can find and I read odd things. Uh, and I don't know if you guys read odd things too. I mean, one of the things that I found that's a buried innovation on the part of adults is that we tend, I used to have this activity I did which seemed to some of our customers to be a totally offensive thing. And that was, I'd say, do you mind if I actually look in your inbox? And they say, well, that's kind of personal. I said, well, you can get all the personal stuff out of there. I'm just curious to see what you read. Because I think if we can upgrade what you read, you can come up with more innovation. So that seemed OK. Maybe we'll let you do that. And so I would go through their inbox, and what would I discover? That people generally subscribe to and read publications about the field that they're in, right? So you guys, if I went in your inbox and I looked at your specialties, you probably subscribe to all the publications about your specialty. So that's absolutely awesome, OK? And so now you'll know everything that everyone else in your field of study knows. But that's not enough. Because if I only know the stuff that's in my field, that's kind of as much as I'm going to know. But if I know the stuff in my field and stuff from other people's fields, then I can start putting those things together and come up with really kind of compelling ideas. So since, again, I'm a geographer, I have no field, so I just read stuff that I like. And I tend to read all the like science magazines and engineering magazines, even though I don't understand a lot of it, and magazines about discovery. And I read travel magazines just to get an idea about what's going on in different places. And I love, which you should all read, Popular Mechanics. So how many of you regularly read Popular Mechanics? Don't be embarrassed. You're brilliant if you do, OK. But you should all read this. And you know you can get a subscription. I know it's cost prohibitive. I know the government is cutting costs for $12 a year, OK? So for $12 a year, you can have access to a lot of wisdom. We can get like a joint subscription for all of you. And so if I read the new Popular Mechanics, and every month in Popular Mechanics, it's about people who are trying to solve problems that you guys might not know so much about. So in the latest issue of Popular Mechanics, the, did you know that engineers at the University of Southern California have developed a vest that can guide people with visual impairments? How many of you knew that? Okay, so somebody knew this. Do you read Popular Mechanics or you know about these people? Okay, so this is kind of cool, don't you think? So I think it's kind of cool. Now, the technology is a little bit funky right now, okay? They have to do some work on it because it has this big, like, sensing thing that you wear on, like, a bicycle helmet. But they're working on that. You know, so it has a head-mounted stereo camera that feeds 3D data to vision software that identifies obstacles and computes a path around them. The vest contains four micro motors 
at the shoulders and waist that vibrate like cell phones alerting users of the location of an obstacle. The next step for researchers is to shrink the current system so it can be mounted on a pair of eyeglasses. So that's kind of interesting, don't you think? These people would be interesting to know because they're at least thinking about things related to some folks that matter to you. And you would find it out if you hadn't found it out already just by reading one of my favorite magazines, Popular Mechanics, or Popular Science, you could read that. So the reality is part of the thing that keeps us from being innovative is we just don't open our eyes to the fact that there's so much cool stuff going on out there. And I don't know that these people have sought you guys out, you know, or sought out other folks. Yeah. I don't know if this is on. Um, I'm curious, Paul, about your experience with this vest, and I'm wondering if they thought about putting it onto a belt buckle, because most blind people I know don't wear glasses. Yeah, it makes sense, doesn't it? But you know, they need you, and you need them. Hi, uh, Paul Schrader with AFB. Uh, pa pa um, interesting thought, and, and we could debate the, the value of it another time. I, I, your premise is interesting, of course, that it's good to get to know these people. There, there are some of us, it, certainly in, in my disability field, the blindness field, who we do a lot of the, uh, whatever the equivalent of eye rolling would be if we don't do a ro ro roll of our eyes. Oh yeah, another another university student with a really brilliant idea to help blind people that none of us need and none of us want uh, and, and isn't going to really do anything valuable. There's a lot of stuff like that. doesn't mean it's not worth pursuing or considering, but there is a lot of, of sort of wasted effort. And the primary reason is they didn't talk to blind people about what they really want. I mean, and that is part of, I would think, what innovation really needs to contemplate is, you know, if you're talking about an audience, what does that audience actually want from you? Paul is your name? Yeah. Yeah, I think we got somebody else. Okay, go. I'll, I'll build on that. I'm Deborah Kaplan um, with the Social Security Administration currently. Um, and for those of us who've been in the field for a long, long time, um, we strongly believe that people with disabilities are more likely to be innovators um, and problem solvers because we often can't get by with the solutions that everybody else does. And so we have to be pretty open-minded about the environment around us and constantly be looking for solutions that work for us. For me, a chair is not a chair, it's a table. Um, and so all the chairs in my house are tables. I got stuff on them because um, that's what works for me. And there's, a, I used to work at um, an organization called the World Institute on Disability, which does disability research. And we would pretty much start by talking with people with disabilities. And our presumption was that people with disabilities had a lot of solutions um, that a lot of people weren't even asking for. See, so I think you're both, here. I think you're both exactly right. And so now let's add the one dimension that you're talking about into the equation that's most compelling is that we ask customers or users for anything we might work on, what really matters to them. Now, but so where I see the power, and again, I'm not smart enough to know about any of these ideas, but I'm smart enough hopefully to realize that if we could take people who knew what their issue was and had some ideas, and we take some people who know something about different technologies, and we could get them in a room together, we could have something developed that would be compelling. But what happens a lot of the time is we don't get the right people together. So I'm always curious about who is at least thinking about some things, even if they don't know and they haven't asked the right questions. And can I have a conversation with them to see if I might get them in a direction because I know they want to try and solve a problem that makes a difference. And I think we don't always do that. So how do we put together all the right people and ask the right questions and then get people to kind of work together to solve things? But how do we be open so we find all these people? and challenge ourselves to be as smart as we can about a world full of people who want to try and address the same issues. And then if we bring them together, can solve them in the right way or a more compelling way. Yeah. I thank you for your presentation so far. And I think this is a perfect point to plug the Interagency Committee for Disability Research. <laughs> 
which is the whole point of it is exactly that. And uh, is, is everybody here familiar with ICDR or is anyone not? Um, it's a it's a it's a group actually that's run out of NIDER uh, across the street uh, that has statutory members from across the federal government and I'm the co-chair along with the fellow from NASA of the assistive technology subcommittee and uh, if anybody wants any information I'm Matt Quinn I'll be here afterwards but the whole point of it is to try to bring folks together from across the government to address issues of uh, various types for people with disabilities to align research to align all sorts of things so sorry seemed that's like great. a good point no I appreciate that that's great you know so the interesting thing is and this raises a compelling point is the thing that ought to drive all innovation is some deeper understanding of customers okay so um, and if we can understand the folks that we're trying to innovate with and what really matters to them, we can be far more successful and compelling in doing things. And examples abound of that. You know, a project that I worked on a number of years ago, which was kind of not the most significant, but a really interesting one, kind of bore that up to me. So uh, how many of you ever heard of a bank that's now called TD Bank, but it's called Commerce Bank, America's most convenient bank? And did any of you ever bank there? Okay. okay, for those of you who did, was it better than other banks? In terms of convenience, I hope it was, because that was the hallmark of this bank. Um, 20 years ago, I was asked to help a big bank, which was not Commerce Bank, to figure out how to provide better customer service. Um, and they were ranked the worst bank in customer service um, in America. Um, they were a bank, if, you're, if you grew up or lived in Philadelphia, called First Union Bank. And they had ranked as number 20 out of the 20 largest banks in America in terms of customer service. They were subsequently bought by Wachovia. Bless their hearts. Well, I think they bought Wachovia, but because Wachovia had a better reputation for customer service, they kept the Wachovia name, some kind of odd thing like that. Now, at the time that I went to work with them, they, they said, well, you know, we've heard that you're reasonably clever. You know a lot about customers. We want to become better at customer service. And I said, well, that's really cool. Um, and so um, I said, well, let's think about the customer. And I said, let's start with the basic premise that you have about banking, and that is that it's okay to be open from nine to three, Monday to Friday. That's a really interesting idea. Because if you do that, you can make it so most customers will not be able to come to the bank. And so I said, if you're trying to accomplish that, that's a really brilliant thing. And they said, well, what could we do better? So we came up with the idea that a bank would be open seven days a week, okay? And then we decided that a bank should be open longer hours. So we proposed that a bank would be open at seven in the morning. Why? Because people want to do banking before they go to work, because then a lot of people, once they go to work, can't go to bank. And that it would stay open till eight o'clock at night, Monday through Friday, and then it would be open Saturday from nine to five and Sunday from nine to one. Um, so we proposed that. And then we came up with some other ideas like having actual financial literacy education in a bank branch, that people could come in and we'd have an educator in a bank branch who would actually talk to people and especially would also invite them to bring their children to start teaching them. We'd offer classes on that. That seemed like an interesting idea. And then we would have a concierge in the bank branch who when you arrived at the bank branch would ask you what your need was. And then if they could meet that need right away, they'd say, we don't want to waste your time. We're going to make an appointment for you and the person who can solve your problem will get to you. So we had a set of like 10 things we were going to do. And then we presented that to the board of the bank and they said, well, you know, we can't do any of this. It's too unbank-like. And I said, but you know, your problem is you're viewed as the worst bank in America. So isn't it time to do something different? They decided not to do that. One of the people who was in that group, though, decided to leave and be part of the starting of Commerce Bank, America's most convenient bank. And so armed with the ideas they had and the ideas that we had come up with, he decided he would think about a different bank that was open 7 to 8 at night. But it was open cooler than 7 to 8 at night because we had come up with an idea that was even crazier. And that was that the bank actually would be open till it would say 8 at night, but it would be open till 8.10 every night. Now, why would we do that? Have you ever been late to get somewhere? And just as you get there, they close the doors. And you say, hey, I'm a customer. And they look at their watch and go, hey, we're closed. And so you say, hey, I hate you. And they say, hey, I just don't care. Okay. <laughs> you know. 
<laughs> so, so we decided that at Commerce Bank, the world should work this way. It would say 8 o'clock, up till 8.10, anybody racing to get to the bank. As we saw them coming up to the door, someone would be at the door and hold the door open and say, relax, we waited for you. <laughs> Is that like a really cool idea? Is that like unbanking? It's the opposite of banking. And so we did that actually. That was kind of a cool idea. And so people would come, it'd be 8.05, the door would swing open. We waited for you. They'd go, God, I love you. I'm going to tell all my friends about you. We'd, it absolved us from having to be that much better than any other bank. Okay, the, uh, no, but so the idea was that if you figure out what really bugs or challenges customers most and you work around that, you can become very successful. They, in fact, became the fastest growing bank in America. If it weren't for the fact that the guy who founded Commerce Bank, a guy named Vernon Hill, had some other kind of federal and IRS issues <laughs> that had nothing to do with the bank, they would have continued to be the fastest growing bank in America. But these other issues made it so that he needed to sell this bank and the folks at TD have done it. They've kept on some of these things, but it's not, they're not as passionate about the folks at Commerce Bank to doing it. But it's all about thinking about what really kind of matters to the customer. Um, when I want to think about what matters to the customer, I mentioned the world is filled with ideas and insights and inspiration. And so if I wanted to really understand customers, I could find really experienced salespeople and send them off to do that. Um, but I know people who are better at that because I've had two daughters who have been Girl Scouts. And so, so I try to learn from all aspects of the world around me. And I learned something brilliant from all the years I followed our daughters through the neighborhood as they sold Girl Scout cookies. So anybody ever bought Girl Scout cookies? Okay. Anybody ever bought Thin Mints, the most popular? 45% of all sales of Girl Scout cookies are Thin Mints. They say they freeze well. You know. They're good. They're not, are they the world's greatest cookie? No. Oh, well, <laughs> okay, no, they'll be glad to know this. Having said they're not necessarily the world's greatest cookie, anybody want to guess in the limited window last year in which Girl Scouts were selling cookies, what volume of Girl Scout cookies were sold? Six million packages. That's, you were right with the 200 year. No, 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 no that's okay. Uh, if we do the math, they sold last year $850 million worth of Girl Scout cookies within like a month's time. So that would translate at three, is it 350 a box? Uh, I don't know, like 225 million boxes of Girl Scout cookies. Now, I would argue at their best, the, Girl Scout, the cookies are insignificant. What really matters is the conversation that Girl Scouts have with a neighbor. So. I would follow our daughters. They would knock on a door. The Acker, Mrs. Ackerman would open the door and she'd say, Carly, is it Girl Scout cookie time of year again? And Carly would say, yes, Mrs. Ackerman, I'm delighted to be here. Mrs. Ackerman would say, Carly, can you come in for a minute for a cup of hot chocolate? Carly would say, well, sure, I've only had six cups of hot chocolate today. <laughs> uh, and then Carly was smart enough to now get into a conversation with Mrs. Ackerman about her life and what mattered to her. So, Mrs. Ackerman, is your daughter home from college? No, she's still there, but she's a senior. She'll be home soon. And I'm assuming she won't get a job, so she'll be home permanently here. Um, well, Mrs. Ackerman, have you taken any nice vacations lately? Well, no, it's been a tough economy. I haven't. Well, I'm sure you've enjoyed your garden. Your garden looks quite lovely this year. And so Carly, and then Mrs. Ackerman would say, so Carly, how's school? Well, Mrs. Ackerman, school has not changed since last year. It is really the one great burden in my life. <laughs> Well, and how's your brother, Carly? Well, let's make that two great burdens in my life. <laughs> your dog? Well, yes, Mrs. Ackerman, now you've hit a subject I like. You know, if only my brother could be another dog, life would be perfect. And so a 20-minute conversation ensues in which they basically talk about the things that neighbors talk about. They have fun, they enjoy each other, and then at the end, Carly says, you know, I'd love to stay for longer, Mrs. Ackerman, but I know that last year you bought six boxes of Thin Mints and four boxes of Dosey Dose. Can I count on you for those this year? Now, what's Mrs. Ackerman going to say? <laughs> sure, Carly, just sign me up for anything, okay? And then Carly says, because she's actually a pretty clever salesperson, you know, there are two new flavors. Um, this year, there's a ginger one and a lemon one. And Mrs. Ackerman, just as she's about to say, well, give me one of each of those, Carly says, no, Mrs. Ackerman, those lemon cookies are the nastiest cookie I've ever eaten. But two boxes of the ginger, I think you'd really enjoy those. 
Then Carly takes the order and promises to bring the cookies when they arrive and she's done. In the 20 minutes, she would have demonstrated what I think we all need to do to connect with customers, and that is have conversations that matter. What Girl Scouts do is they bring an 80-year tradition of what it means to be a neighbor in a world in which neighborliness is not always what it used to be. And I think if we understand the power of having conversations with those we serve and the partners that we want to bring together to help us serve them, we can, as you guys are saying over here, come up with truly kind of compelling, difference-changing ideas and innovations. But we have to be open to connecting with people be open to a world of ideas and possibilities. Let me kind of wrap up this part and then I'll take any questions with a story that I find to be compelling. Um, I made the mistake of only doing sports when I was growing up that our kids have absolutely no interest in. And so our kids now are interested in sports I didn't do. And so I played basketball and baseball and football and uh, until somebody told me I was actually too small to play football. Uh, and too small to play basketball, and too slow to play baseball. But anyway, be that as may. The, uh, so our kids swim, and uh, they play soccer. And so I've become, the only way to ever kind of tolerate a swim meet is you have to be like, you have to do a job there, because otherwise the swim meet goes on for day, forever, you know? And your kid swims, I don't know, for 30 seconds or something like that. So I decided I'd become a swim meet official. And so over the years of our kids swimming, I've become a swim meet official. So now I'm one of the most seasoned swim referees, even though I was never a competitive swimmer. But I love swimming. I now swim. And uh, swimming is interesting. Um, but I want to ask you, because I, in studying swimming, I learned kind of a powerful lesson that I think applies to all of us. And so let me ask you, how many of you here swim? Any of you? And how many of you know the four basic swim strokes that are used in any swim competition, whether it's the Montgomery County, Maryland Swim League, the Fairfax County Swim League, the Spanish Olympic team, or any of the Chinese Olympic team? The four strokes are? Breast. Okay. Yeah. Free back, breast, and butterfly. Okay. So there's freestyle, there's backstroke, there's breaststroke, and there's butterfly. And the fastest stroke that is used in competition is the freestyle. Okay, fastest stroke known. There's reason to believe that for about 18 to 20 meters, a good butterflyer can keep up with a freestyler, but it's really an exhausting and kind of funny stroke. Uh, so that's the so second fastest is the butterfly. The third fastest stroke used in competition is the backstroke. And the slowest stroke used in competition is the breaststroke. Kind of, okay. <laughs> and the breaststroke is a really funky stroke. Okay, so you displace a lot of water. You know, you're kind of in and out of the water. It's got a kick that patterned after a frog, not the world's fastest swimmers. Um, and so, but the, but the breaststroke is a really good stroke if you're in water where there could be impediments in the water, like jellyfish. It's a really good stroke, so you can kind of see them in front of you. Um, and it was the preferred stroke for people in uh, the only part of the world that cared about competitive swimming because in the 1800s, there was only one place in the world we know about in which people cared about competitive swimming, and that was Northern Europe. And they had swim meets whenever the water got warm enough, about 51 degrees Fahrenheit, they would hold a swim meet. <laughs> Let me kind of get my goggles on here so that I can actually kind of compete here. <sighs> I probably should, it's like the airport, you should probably take off your shoes to swim. But anyway, okay, so in the 1800s, Northern Europe, they had swim meets whenever they could. They brought the finest swimmers from Northern Europe. They'd get together, they would compete. They had only one problem as we now know it, and that is in the 1800s, the only stroke that Northern Europeans had ever figured out how to swim was the breaststroke, the slowest stroke known to humans. It's 1844, a swim meet is held in London, England, and as the swim meet's about to begin, two Native Americans show up at the swim meet. They came from South America to be exact, the Amazon, how they'd gone there, we don't know. Maybe they swam there. Uh, <laughs> but they'd heard that there was a swim competition other than just competing against each other. They had never swum in a swim competition. It sounded cool to them. They came and asked, can we compete? The host, eager to show that they were the world's finest swimmers, said, please, come along. They explained the rules to them very simply. This was the place you start. You would swim out to a place that was marked in the water. You'd come around that place and turn around. You'd come back to here. Whoever touched here first was declared the winner. Winners would get a medal. The way the race was started was we will say, take your mark, then we will shoot a gun, then you will start. Other than the gun part, the visitors were okay. But they said, <laughs> we'll manage that, just promise us you'll shoot the gun up in the air. They lined up, they stretched, just as they should before a swim meet. They got ready. They waited for the gun. They said, take your mark. <laughs> 
the gun went off. They flew into the water. The only problem with these people was they were swimming a variation of the freestyle, the fastest stroke known to human beings. At the halfway point, the host looked at them and said, God, what is that weird thing they're doing in the water? Will they stay afloat? That's really kind of strange. They'll get tired. It'll be okay. But at the halfway point, they were way ahead. And by the end, they were twice as far ahead as they were at the halfway point. This happened for every single race that these folks entered. They won every single race. At the end of the meet, they were given their medals, and one might have imagined that the host, having seen a better way to swim, would have invited these people to stay and teach them how to swim. But instead, they wished them well, sent them off, and then huddled as a group of Northern Europeans, determined to figure out how to swim the breaststroke faster, so that next time, <laughs> when these people came, they would kick their butts. <sighs> this went on for 29 years. Northern Europeans focused on perfecting the only swimming stroke they had ever figured out how to swim. But it was not meant to be. Then in 1873, a young man named John Trudgeon became the coach of one of London's finest swim clubs. He had never seen anyone swim the freestyle, but he'd heard from an older member of the club of the day when two Native Americans had come and had swum a freaky, funky stroke that was so much faster than what they swam. Determined to help his team be better swimmers, he set out in search of these people. And he went to Brazil and to the Amazon until he found people there who swam. He stayed there and had them teach him how to swim. And when he felt really comfortable that he'd mastered this and had drawn detailed pictures of everything that they did in the water, he took the three-month journey back to London. There he taught his young charges how to swim the freestyle. And as soon as they mastered it, they entered competitions and won every race they entered. Now, bless their hearts, Northern Europeans had seen other Northern Europeans swimming the stroke and decided this was cool to swim now and the world of swimming was changed forever. We now know, to make the most interesting fact about this, which is why I'm glad I got into learning about swimming because of our kids, we now know that for 10,000 years, in every part of the world except Northern Europe, people have been swimming a variation of the freestyle. That the only place where they cared about swimming competitively was the only place where they had no idea how to swim fast. <laughs> So the reason I love this story is because I believe all of us in some way are swimming our own variation of the breaststroke. We do what comes naturally to us, what we were trained to do, what we're comfortable in. And when we see other ideas for how to do things in different ways, we are kind of not so open to doing them, not so open to changing. The challenge we all have, I believe, in anything that matters, in any element of innovation or solving problems or creating opportunities that matters, is to figure out how to be open to combining what we know with a world of brilliant ideas. How we can literally scan the world together to find the most brilliant ideas which when combined and adapted with our own ideas allow us to be brilliant. And that involves having the most fundamental skills of being curious and open and also being capable of taking the time to quickly scan the globe to see who else is thinking about something that matters to us. And so I believe that's actually the biggest challenge. If I had a limited amount of resources and a limited amount of time, I put my best ideas on the table and I'd quickly search the world to see who else had brilliant ideas and I'd get them together either in person or if I had a low budget on Skype, are we allowed to Skype in the federal government? Okay, good. <laughs> so I would get them together and I would look at their faces and I'd look at the stuff that they're doing or I would hear their voices or I would get a text of whatever they were doing, but I would communicate with a world of people who together have the power to solve compelling problems. And I'd be open to the possibility that armed with a purpose that matters, I can challenge the world to come up with brilliance. I just have to figure out how to unlock the people who want to be my partners. So I don't know if this has been helpful. I've appreciated the chance to be here with you today. If you have any questions, I would be delighted to answer them. Otherwise, I'd be delighted to give you 20 more minutes to get whatever you need to get done, done. Thank you for inviting me.
in a, in a world of probably future decreasing budgets and in a, you know, in a corporate world where you know, every, every last dollar, you know, I've, I've been confronted with, you know, these are a lot of great ideas, but, you know, we need to just rank the ones that are going to be, you know, the most bang for our buck. Right. And knowing full well that it's really, really hard, especially in a research type world or an innovation type place to, to really early on try to separate the wheat from the chaff. As you've, I'm sure, been confronted with this in, in, in the places where you've consulted or, or worked, can you, can you help us communicate just how hard that is or what advice have you given to, to senior leadership in that, in that regard? Well, I think you have to do both, okay? So did everybody get the question of how in a world of kind of constrained resources, where a lot of times we need to do a bunch of different kind of tests or try a bunch of different things to ever get to the good stuff, how we can get folks to understand that, the folks who might support us? Always well, double down on what already works. Well, I think what we do, so right. So what drives us then is we tend to do things that are really close, like we slightly modify the kick on the breaststroke, you know? or we stay under the water for a millisecond less when we come up. So I think what happens is, there is there's a lot of pressure, you know, so companies face it, everybody is facing it. So I think we have to do two things. One is we have to consistently advocate that we don't, we don't know what are gonna be the best kind of projects that we're working on. Um, at the same time, we have to kind of figure out in advance which ones are likely to be the best. So we have to be studying what we do and what's worked in the past um, not the specific solutions, but kind of processes or ideas. And we need to figure out how to, on the cheap how to get our ideas up to a point where we can pass judgment on them. So that's what most companies do. Is most companies say we're open to an awful lot of ideas, but we're going to have you use what we call sweat equity to get your idea up to this point. You've got to do a certain amount of the research on your own. We'll give you some facilities and you know a little bit of funds, but you basically have got to do it. You've got to make an investment to show us that this idea is worthy of more investment. And so we have a bunch of stuff that's in a first basket in which we really push partners and folks to work a little bit harder over time to make the case for their idea. You know, and we have a set of criteria that we're having them kind of look at. You know, does it, is the technology possible? Does it really meet the needs of the folks that we're trying to serve? You know, can we prove that it really meets it? Will it be a significant difference to those folks? Is there some economic model where we could see this kind of working? So that's the first thing. The other thing is I think you guys have to rely, when I don't have a lot of resources, I have to be resourceful. And so resourceful means I have to find partners who are, who are motivated to do a bunch of this stuff for me. So I've got to figure out what's the upside if this really works for them, and are there some things that I can do, and you know, and I'm again, I'm not a government person, so I don't know. Are there some ways that if they could make an investment to come up with something, I could pave the way to make it easier for it to get out in the marketplace? I could, through regulation or whatever ways that I can kind of influence policy, I could make it so the market is more open and susceptible. Now, in an ideal world, but I don't know, you know, I'm, because I'm not an economist, kind of, I don't understand how by creating a million tax breaks we can actually generate more kind of revenue. I don't know that, but you know, so, but, so I'm trying to figure that out, but are there some ways that I could create some tax incentives that would be truly appealing, not kind of bogus incentives, to get new ideas kind of commercializing out there? So I would, do, I would cast a broader net for partners. I would be honest and say, okay, these are our best ideas. Now we're gonna take the time to do the next step, and that is see who else in the world has been working on similar ideas. Because I have to be honest. Now I realize in a lot of respects, you know, the Swedes drive me crazy, but in a lot of respects, fees are pretty advanced, okay? As long as I don't have to go into Ikea, I'm okay. Um, the, but so I realize that if that's just the first place I turn, because I know a lot about Sweden and I can read enough Swedish to figure out what these people are doing. Um, if that's the place I turn, they're not the only people who are thinking about stuff. So what's our network of people around the world of like-minded people who are working on the same issues and how do we share information so that we can say, these are the 20 things on my list. Have you tried any of these things? Which are the ones that are most promising? Have you tried any of these things? Um, so I want to challenge myself to do that so I've done enough homework up front so I can really zoom in. So when I go to folks and say I need funding, I got a better sense that these are the four or five things that really have the potential. So I just got to do more homework up front. The world is just driving every company and organization to do more homework at little cost so they can invest the money at kind of 
you know, that's going to have the biggest payout. You know, and it's changing in lots of industries. I did a fascinating project that was an awful lot of fun that again to me seemed obvious because remember I'm not a scientist, I'm a geographer. And so I actually worked with a big pharmaceutical company um, in which as opposed to suggesting that they hire more scientists uh, to come up with some new compounds for a particular disease area, I suggested that they actually send people to villages in remote rural parts of the world and talk to people about what they do to treat certain types of diseases, what they've done because some people have kind of figured out elements of it and use that as the basis for new pharmaceuticals. And they actually came up with uh, several powerful ideas based on doing that. Because in fact, an awful lot of pharmaceuticals are based on natural compounds. But we had we'd gotten to an era where most of what we were doing was scientists in a lab trying to create new compounds, as opposed to saying, let's, it, let's enhance natural things that we find. You know, so my idea is let's just be open. Let's quickly do, I think your best capability is to get as smart as you can about as many things around the world that could influence what you're trying to accomplish and to connect with people. And I believe because everybody's constrained with resources other than it seems the Swedes are not, I think we ought to, we ought to share, people want to pool and share information. So I want to be connecting, I always want to be talking to these people. And there I joke about Skype, which was invented by Swedes, okay? is amazing, okay? So now I have the ability to talk with and communicate with anybody, you know, around the world. So, so I think we have, so there are tools now. So let's just all collaborate. Whatever tools we use to collaborate, let's just try and make that happen. And let's share our insight so as a world wrestling with the same issues, we can get to the heart of it and cut out the stuff that somebody else has already figured out hadn't worked. Because wouldn't you be upset if you, spent zillions of dollars and then found that the UPS guy had solved your problem. So similarly, if you've got a bunch of things on your list, I bet somewhere in the world half of the things on your list somebody's already kind of figured out has promise or they've discarded. That was a long-winded answer. <sighs> Sorry. Okay. Wow. Um, okay, so over here. Um, let's see. Uh, you were kind of starting to get at the question I was was going to ask you, of course, I, I did want to observe, what, was it the Danes that came up with Bluetooth that only works about half the time and, and something <laughs> like that? Um, the, the, the dis a, lot of, uh, a lot of the interest here, I think, stems around disability and how do we get people to innovate in that space. And, I, and I, you know, we were starting down that path. There, w one of the reasons we have laws is our belief that disability never really gets full consideration in the market. And one of the things we understand from companies is that at the start of the process, there's lots of innovative ideas. It's not that people lack for them. There's, there's plenty of ideas of how a product could be made and how it could work for people with disabilities. But, but fairly soon, all those bad people, like you didn't talk about marketing, but they're, boy, talk about bad people. HR is fine, but <laughs> you, get, you get the marketers in there also, oh, we can't possibly sell this, we can't possibly do this. And all of a sudden, all the restrictions, all the regression to mean starts to happen. Right. And so it's not really about innovative products, it's about market strength of products. Right. And so we're not probably going to win that battle on market strength. So I guess my question to you is, how do we, and I'm not from, from the government, so I really have no budget. I'm in the nonprofit world. Hell, we're, we're about ready to be dead. Um, and so how do we help figure out a way to uh, encourage companies to, to be innovative and to address disability issues? Because it almost seems as though we have to trick companies into it uh, and, and end up having them do some stuff without them actually knowing that they did it, and then all of a sudden people get, get excited about the fact that, that, uh, that there's some accessibility built into a product, and, and it's almost as if it happened without a company. We got slid, you know, slid it past the marketers and legal people or something uh, to get it to happen. But how do, how do we make innovation happen from the outside or encourage innovation to happen from the outside? Well, no, so that's a, that's a huge business question. So in the absence of there being, there, there are just not a lot of companies that in the absence of being able to create an economic profitable model are going to launch products uh, or are going to add elements to products that will be um, that will cost them something and they don't see a return from it so we have to figure out I think how to reinvent the kind of profit equation and so I got to do some thinking about that I mean one thing that strikes me is how do we get I believe there are a bunch of things that companies can develop that are enabling for people with disabilities that could help them make their products more valuable to an even bigger market. 
So I have to think a little bit about that. You know, I'm not smart enough right now to figure that one out. Um, I have to think about, is there a bigger market than beyond companies, again, just thinking about the US? Is there a bigger market which if I organize a broader global market and create some opportunities for them, then the economics suddenly kind of change? Are there ways that I can put them together with another partner who through some type of distribution or some efficiency of manufacturing, if they're a smaller company, can create different economics? But I think you're right. As a business, you have to figure out except for a limited number of things if I'm a big business that I might be willing to do and not make money off of, how do I make money? So I have to think about some different business models. Yeah. I'm sorry for asking all the questions. Yeah. But um, the, the, the ICDR, um, the, the assistive technology subcommittee that I actually just, I, my co-chair is from NASA and we just started a couple of months ago and after listening to folks, we really can't. This is really a really central issue because the business proposition, or the value, the, the 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 nuts and bolts, dollars and cents for assistive technology, just isn't there. And so, one of our key themes, uh, and this this is applicable to um, government research especially, is that a lot of research is done in Department of Defense and NASA and NIH and lots of places that spend a lot of money on these things. Uh, that could be applicable to people with disabilities. So, for example, uh, the Department of Defense has spent a lot of money on exoskeletons that makes, you know, the, for, for the battlefield. Could that be, be applicable to people with disabilities? Sure. Um, there's, uh, NASA also did a bunch of research and developed optics and other things that have been applicable to. Uh, the other key, the, the other side of this is uh, and and I think a, a key opportunity for this is that is is aging. A lot of money is going to be spent on things uh, for the elderly population. There are some 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 overlap. So thinking about it in those terms, and this is also a hook for us to try to get these agencies engaged, even if they don't specifically earmark money for research in this area. The other is to to sort of couch it in um, broader terms. So there's a, a, a ICDR and, and Access Board had a meeting on auto personalization uh, using cloud solutions. And they said, this isn't just for people with disabilities. All of us have personalization desires around how you want to see a computer screen. I like high contrast. I like a little bit of bigger text. And so to, to present this as an extension or a multi-generational type product to these to, to businesses is a, is a way to uh, to make this a little more attractive. Um, NIDER next door has a grantee at University of mm, in Buffalo uh, that helps their grantees uh, around assistive technology with solving some of these kind of issues, framing it from a business perspective. Um, it would be great to, to, to share that with this group or to, to introduce you. And I, I, I ran across, I, I'm sorry to no, take the time, but. I think, I think all of you are right about, I think, on a business sense, you've got to, so you're talking about a couple of things. One is you've got to figure out, is there already stuff out there that an investment has been made? Because you think about businesses make an investment and then they expect a return. If I can reduce the cost of the investment because there's some technology out there, then I've changed the economics. If I can create a bigger market downstream, you know, where the stuff that I'm developing is more, is applicable to a broader market, whether it's an international market or a market that now includes kind of an aging population that has some of the same needs, now I've made it more desirable. Yeah, so I think those are, I think those are great ideas. Yeah. Um, I'd like to hear your thoughts, and I, just listening to you, I just kind of not now thought of it. We have a lot of laws and regulations concerning disability access that say you must do this if it's readily achievable or if it doesn't have great expense or effort or, uh, did this come up? Yeah. Stand next to you, right? Talking <laughs> to my tie. <laughs> the secret um, tie. So some of these regulations say, you know, if it's readily achievable or if it's achievable, and I'm just wondering, is that 
we can look at certain products that are out there and say, see, it's achievable, but is there almost like a counter incentive to make something? Because once you come out with something and you say, we've done it, we know it's achievable, but are, I mean, are, are people hiding things because they want to escape regulation? You know, I'm not the smartest person to answer that. I know quite, you know, I think the difficulty with humans and organizations is they, they do the things they want to do. Uh, and if there's some wiggle room, so, you know, I'm not a politician or a regulator. Um, I know what's interesting, you know, so I've given a few comparisons. When they decide to do something in Sweden, it gets done by a certain date. It has to be done. So if you look at broadband in Sweden, okay? So Sweden's commitment is by the year 2015, 100% of Swedes will have access to broadband. Right now it's 90%. I sense that's higher than in America? <laughs> by a little bit. Uh, this is one of your gifts. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, there's a national broadband. Okay, so, so, so the issue is if you want to do business in Sweden, this happens, okay? Otherwise, any government subsidies disappear. So that's kind of an incentive for these companies, any favorable tax treatment. So, so I think when we make a commitment, then that's like a bold challenge that folks have to do. If we say, well, it'd be nice if you do this. You know, if somebody said, if it's possible, I can always say it's not possible. So I think the challenge is, and in terms of people hiding stuff, I don't believe in corporations that are hiding stuff that they think there's a big market opportunity. I believe they're avoiding stuff that they don't believe is a significant market opportunity. They're avoiding regulations that might reduce their bottom line or cause an awful lot of additional work for them. So I think that's just the nature of companies. They're trying to focus on the stuff that's going to make them money. And so, and it's going to have, it's going to not be so challenging. So I think if there's an opportunity, folks are actually going to seize it. If there's a legitimate business opportunity, I think they're actually going to seize it. Um, Am I allowed to put someone on the spot? Okay. As long as it's not me. It's Julie. <coughs> She's shaking her head. Uh, my question is, I mean, what do you think about this? Uh, Julie works for the Consumer Electronics Association. I'm actually meeting someone at one, so I'll make it quick. Um, I think that industry really sees opportunities and if you're referring to the CVAA which we supported um, because it struck a very good balance between allowing us to innovate which has been the tone of today's uh, lecture which has been fabulous um, but also um, will enable we hope um, people who need products that are accessible so I think what we don't want are burdensome mandates which will ultimately um, require us to engineer out of products um, if, they're, if they're too expensive or if there are features that are so cumbersome but aren't really needed by every single member of the population. But businesses run on bottom lines. If there's a profit to be made, of course, um, they're going to pursue it. Um, but ultimately, I, th I think it's the consumer who wins the day, walk into a Best Buy, there aren't a lot of products on the shelf necessarily that aren't of interest to consumers. Um, business Innovation drives business and business drives innovation. So, um, you know, in, in with respect to the CVIA, we hope that it can be implemented in a way that will get everybody what they need. I hope that answers your question. Jamal? Um, I'm wondering if, if you've been um, enamored with any particular kind of online in environments that promote collaboration, since it obviously costs money to bring people together in person, the more that we can also take advantage of online uh, environments the better. Are there any particular ones that you might suggest or where there's been research that shows uh, productive collaboration? Yes. No, those are really good questions. I'm not the smartest person to answer those. So, I mean, I use the stuff that works for me, you know, and some of our customers use the tools that they have that work for them. 
I think we're in an era, but I think this is an interesting thing. So we're in an era now where, especially for like a new generation of folks, they have a high comfort level kind of living and interacting online. I mean, I worry a lot about that when I see our kids because they text and they email and they Skype and that's good for them. And I believe breakthroughs happen. I believe the groundwork for some breakthroughs and innovation can happen online through any one of these tools. We can share information and you know, we can email and share information. Then we can have a kind of face-to-face -face conversation. I mean, I've made my life simple because I use Apple products. And so I can sit in front of any one of my Apple devices and then kind of communicate with somebody else sitting in front of an Apple device. So I think they've figured out for a large number of people how to make kind of things work. But um, so I think what we need to do to save our, again, it's like saving our resources. I believe up front we want to share information with folks without spending a lot of money to do it. We want to kick around ideas. We want to suggest things to them. We want to have some online communication and engagement with them. Then I think in an epic moment when we're ready to make something happen, I think we bring people together to have an experience of being together because I think there's something in my work that is the chemistry of people together creates some excitement here. It's hard to have an orchestra play. It's, a, it's easy for individual performers to play music in their locations. But if I now want to create a symphony of ideas, I need to have everybody together. If I want to have a jazz ensemble playing off each other, I got to really have kind of the cues from being near somebody. So, so I think of that, but I think there's stuff that's happening. You know, Unfortunately, some of the tools right now are expensive tools. You know, so if you think about, I mean, expensive if I want to have a large group, because then I need to think about some of these telepresence solutions, and those are pretty darn expensive solutions. I'm spending a few hundred thousand dollars just to kind of play in that world. So I think that's a little bit of a challenge. But I think one-on-one -on -one or with a few small groups, I think there's some tools that are just kind of cheap out there that are allowing people to engage with each other. Well, I thank you for being here uh, and hanging in there. I've appreciated the chance to meet with you and look forward to keeping in touch on the things you're working on. Thank you.